breach uh, and really focus on ways that um, uh, we're finding emerging needs, emerging ways to respond in our, our different contexts. Uh, this morning, we're going to focus uh, on some of the stories of response in rural settings across our conference. Um, and we'll be able to have a time of um, conversation with some panelists uh, here from those settings and uh, then be able to talk in a question and answer time about other ways that we're finding um, it helpful to connect, uh, to kind of leverage our, our shared uh, resources and ways that we might be able to work together. Uh, but at this time, I'd love for us to begin with prayer. This comes to us from uh, Father Richard Rohr, who some of you are familiar with uh, as a, a spiritual writer. Let's pray. Oh, great love, thank you for living and loving in us and through us. May all that we do flow from our deep connection with you and all beings. Help us become a community that vulnerably shares each other's burdens and the weight of glory. Listen to our heart's longings for the healing of the world. Please add your own uh, prayers at this time for those in your lives that are affected <laughs> and for ourselves as we navigate this time. As we enter a moment of silence. Knowing that you are hearing us better than we are speaking, we offer all these prayers spoken in silence in all the holy names of God. Amen. Well, we'd love to... Um... <laughs> Hi, Hetty. I guess Hetty's going to be joining us this morning. Um... <laughs> uh, so this morning, I'd love to also plug the other calls that will uh, be happening uh, throughout this week. Uh, some of you will um, be already familiar with the calls that are uh, were sent out by the conference office. I will uh, go ahead and post those uh, on the chat feature so that to make sure you know uh, the Zoom call um, numbers and all of that information, we want you to be able to take advantage of that this week um, as soon as I can uh, find that. Uh, I will post that on our uh, uh, page. I'll find that as our presenters are talking. So this morning, uh, we have the uh, pleasure of uh, being joined by uh, Reverend Sylvia Wang, who's senior pastor at First UMC Archer City, and Reverend Ricky, Wilson, uh, Ricky Harrison, uh, who's the associate pastor of First UMC Decatur and Pecan Street Mission uh, there in Decatur, and uh, Reverend Chris uh, Yost, who is at Wesley UMC in Greenville. Welcome, everyone. Um, and I'd love, you know, beginning with Sylvia, um, if you could share with us just kind of a thumbnail sketch of the ways that you found um, needs emerging in your community and the ways that uh, both you as a, as a church, um, but also just generally the community there in Archer City have, have responded. Sure, I'll start with an example. Not this weekend, but the weekend before, there was a fire that uh, caused a total loss of a home for an Archer City family. And I saw how quickly the community came together. I had two different text messages come in uh, that Saturday night. And then soon after that, I learned about how the community had organized a meal train online, as well as uh, somebody took, uh, took the family in. And um, so the family has a place to live in the, in the community. And also there's a Go, GoFundMe page set up. Also the Archer City Independent School District, the staff office, they have been receiving gift cards from the community. And that's just one simple example of how on top of the coronavirus crisis, this other crisis hit a family in the community came together. And 
don't know the person who organized the meal train, but I, I think she has connections to the Baptist church here. And so this is just an example of how the existing relationships that cross the denominations in Archer City come together, even though there may be theological differences, but in a time of emergencies, people overlook all that and just come together. Other examples, I saw on Facebook that the Archer Service Center, it's a senior citizen center. They have programs for seniors as well as lunches on weekdays. And I think they also deliver meals to seniors. Right away, they put together a senior tree, which is similar to Angel Tree. Instructions were don't come to a dining room, but just come to the foyer, grab a card. There's a need listed on it and then bring it back with I imagine whatever need is need to be fulfilled for and that's for the um, older popular older residents in Archer City, as well as uh, the vulnerable. Uh, I also learned that a church member who loves to sew uh, told me that she was making and sewing masks for for uh, medical personnel and without me having to ask her to do it. Uh, she saw on the news local news here in Wichita Falls area. And he, she, she has been making the masks. Uh, the rural community does not, uh, in my community, there's, we don't have a lot of resources, but people still do what they can to support the local restaurants. There's only three restaurants in Archer City and there's a lot more in Wichita Falls. People have been intentional to go support uh, businesses in both locations. And my office manager owns the uh, one of the restaurants in Wichita Falls along with her husband and I know church members have been going up there to do takeout and being very intentional about supporting local businesses and restaurants. The prayer network here in Archer City is deeply rooted with faith and community. We have been sending out prayer requests through through the church email for that. Also I discovered that Facebook is a huge uh, it's a huge thing out in the rural district people post everything all the time and i found that is a is a wonderful way for me as pastor to have presence on my church's facebook page and also to have it on my personal facebook page which have linked up to a lot of people in archer city and actually some people i've not met yet in archer city are my facebook friends so we've been we've been using that to to stay in touch uh, and through that i've been finding out about you know, to people's needs. Uh, so the primary tools uh, in terms of um, uh, communications, we have gone back to phones, phone calls, more phone calls. Somebody suggested to me, you know, maybe we take the church directory and divide that up and have some church folks call each other. Well, I thought that would be a wonderful project for the Golden Girls. So I made a call Monday morning to, to the, the leader of the Golden Girls. And these are the older women's group of the church. And um, she said, yeah, sure, I'll, that'll be great. I'll, I'll ask the girls, we'll divide up A to Z, people in the church directory, and we don't have that many. And um, I was so, so touched because, you know, my name is in the W's. I got a phone call from the Golden Girl to see how I was doing. So it's, um, it's just really neat. So that phone calls is one thing. Uh, we do Facebook. Uh, we have done more emails. Um, in my community, people don't really like to do emails, but I've been able to get the key leadership with the worship team, admin council, and and uh, other church-wide emails. So people have gone more to do e more, more so to do emails. I think just circumstances we need to. I don't think we're at a point to do Zoom calls within the church, uh, but text message are are a popular way. People respond very well to text messages. So I've set up text message groups with my admin council and I only have nine so it's manageable for that and so just thinking of ways to stay connected and I think there's still more that we could do I'm just still thinking through it oh I also want to add that I saw on the Archer City ISD Facebook page that the uh, the school and I think is you know the staff and the teachers they have been delivering meals to all their students in the community. And they deliver uh, lunch and breakfast, well, I should say breakfast and lunch, Monday through Friday. And then uh, people who, who are interested, they could email a principal at the school. So that's that's something that when I read about it, I thought that was just, just really amazing that in a really small community of about 
1800, 1900 people in Archer City. There's not that much, you know, wealth to go around, but people do like what they can to help each other out with, you know, with food, with housing, uh, with prayers, and even I'm getting checked up on by by my Golden Girl, make sure I'm okay. So um, that's just some of the ways, and I'm thinking about more ways now that we we do have uh, a whole month of of doing church very differently. So I'm open to more ideas um, on how I can initiate. Right now, I haven't had to really initiate very much with a missional response, except for getting my golden girls to call each other in church, but that's been great. Next. Oh, does that mean, sorry, Andrew, you're cutting out on my end on, for a minute. <laughs> uh, so my name is Ricky. I serve out at uh, First Decatur. Um, honestly, I, I kind of told Andrew, we, we're just honestly stealing some of the best ideas that I've seen from going on around the conference and trying to uh, uh, capitalize on those. So um, pretty early on, one of the things we uh, saw Ashley Ann over at uh, Trophy Club UMC uh, got a bunch of her youth together to do uh, uh, door stop drops. Um, for the older adults in their community that might not be able to go out and get groceries. And so we've got a really incredible uh, class of young families that are really active and really engaged. And one of the young women stepped up and said, hey, like all, all the moms and dads in my Sunday school class are, most of them are not working and are happy to go pick up groceries or medicines and get those to folks. So they've kind of coordinated a network of um, young families that are going out as we find needs of people in our congregation, whether it's picking up groceries or medicines at the pharmacy or whatever they might need to go out and drop it and leave it on their doorstep. Um, uh, one of the ways, uh, Sylvia, I love dividing up the church directory. We, we thought uh, really early on too about like one of the major things is to create as many touch points with folks as possible um, in this season and particularly phone calls to our older folks who are um, in nursing homes specifically uh, are, are widowed folks that are living on their own, like folks that are particularly isolated in this time. And so uh, Cassie Wade, who's our senior pastor, has uh, organized some, um, uh, basically dividing up the list of folks who we would normally see. And so we've reached out not only um, to our Sunday school leaders, uh, we've been getting them all on Zoom platforms so they can, our Sunday school classes and Bible studies and small groups can still continue to meet together. Um, but also one of the real key asks that we're asking of every single leader in the church, whether they're uh, part of our staff or one of our Sunday school leaders or uh, the lady that coordinates going to visit the people in the nursing homes uh, saying, hey, would you reach out with a phone call? To everyone in your realm of ministry, the 10, a dozen, 15, or 20 folks, just so that we're getting continuous points of contact with folks during this time. Um, and, and that's also worked really well to, to figure out what the needs are. So uh, in some of these phone calls, um, I, I make several every week. Uh, the first week I made a call to one of our older gentlemen who worships, worships with us. He said, well, we're doing good, but I'm worried about uh, so-and-so who's been caring for his wife, uh, you know, Chuck and Sue have been having a hard time I said, uh, Randall, that'd be great. Would you reach out with a phone call to him and, uh, you know, please extend the offer if they need groceries or medicines or anything? He said, oh, I, yeah, that would be great. I could definitely do that, right? So just kind of mobilizing, inviting people into that. I think people want to help during this time. They're just not always sure exactly how to do it or, or what to do. And so that kind of more direct invitation has been really helpful. Um, we've had like some of our young people that are off in college or grad school that have reached out and said, uh, hey, I'm not here, but I feel like I could write letters during this time. If you would just send me a list of maybe some of our people that could use an extra point of encouragement or contact, I'd love to write some short notes and letters to them and send, even though I'm not physically there. So just kind of mobilizing folks to reach out and connect with each other uh, to do the work of the church. Um, one of the early things, so I, I continue to be most concerned about folks that are already on the financial edge during this time. Um, one of the really incredible things that uh, occurs in Decatur is there's this community-wide coalition that uh, includes not only folks from different churches, but people from the school district and some of the businesses of the town. And about 10 years ago, they started a group and they called it Decatur Cares, and they're 
mainly putting food into the hands of our families who are walking through food insecurities. And so one of the things that we do in that is hosting a mobile food pantry on the first Saturday of every month. So Terranary Food Bank sends us an 18-wheeler full of fresh produce, milk, eggs, frozen meats, um, good stuff that you can't often get in the food pantry because it's perishable. And uh, we serve 100, 120 families on a, on a regular month. Um, and so we're really concerned about folks that are, you know, now six to eight weeks without a paycheck. So we're, we're shifting to a drive through only model in this, uh, working this coming Saturday. And that same group of young families who stepped up and said, hey, we've got some extra free time and could help go run groceries or um, pick up meds at the pharmacy have also said, yeah, we can step up during this time because we realize that a lot of the normal volunteers who are there every first Saturday of the month are retired folks and into their active years or even some are older adults who really shouldn't be out of their homes during this time and so um, they've stepped up to help make that happen which has been a really great gift um, uh, one other way we've, we've thought really particularly about how do we leverage the um, gift of our finances so I, I think lots of churches have some kind of um, uh, benevolence fund where, where they're able to help folks that are coming in and need help with a utility bill or a uh, gasoline voucher to put gas in their car to get to work. Um, we have one of those that are ongoing. We see folks during the week and we thought, uh, how do we leverage that during this time to be uh, even more available, not only to members in the church, but people in the community um, who might even need like help with rent payments um, during this time, Wh whatever the thing is, it helps just to get them to the next month in this in-between season. Um, and so we invite our congregation into that. One of the first emails I had in my inbox, like the Tuesday after the first Sunday we all shut down was a congregation member that said, Ricky, I, we'd like to make a gift to this. Will you help us figure out how to direct it? And in a, a, a normal year, we typically take in and give out about $12,000 into that benevolence fund. And in the last three weeks, we've taken in $12,000 into that benevolence fund. Um, which is just an incredible testimony uh, to the, I think we've tried to say again and again in our written communication, when we talk about offering in the context of worship online, to say, we understand there, there's some people that during this time, it's, it's all you can do to keep food on the table for your family and make ends meet and pay the rent. Um, for other bits of us, we're in a place where we can not only continue to give to the church, but even maybe take a step up during this time. And the response to that has just been uh, incredible, the generosity that folks have, have seen in that. So we've tried to just expand our reach with that out to the community. Um, our school district is doing some of the same kind of incredible work, Sylvia, that, that Archer City is doing. They're, um, they started out uh, just opening up the middle school campus for any students to come and pick up a breakfast and lunch uh, every day of the week. And then this, this, this week, they started sending out their bus drivers uh, their bus driver said, hey, there's a lot of the more rural parts of the district that the kids can't make it in. Um, we could go deliver meals to them. And so this uh, this week, they started deploying the bus drivers who are delivering meals out to some of those families, which is really cool. Um, and then another community effort that's been really neat. We have a Lions Club, which is like a rotary club, a kind of a community service organization that uh, uh, we're part of at the church. And so we haven't been meeting uh, while everything's been shut down. We have lunch together have a program, we do service projects in the community, but uh, one of the things the club decided to do last week, they said, you know, we usually meet for lunch and we like to do chicken fried steaks together on the first uh, week of the month, but we can't do that. And so there's a handful of us, uh, we're gonna still pay our caterer. She's gonna come and prepare 60 chicken fried steak meals. And then we're gonna come box them up and take them over to the hospital for our uh, medical staff that are working during this time. So just small things like that to support the community, I think. Um, you know, out, out in the rural area, we've got our first two confirmed cases of uh, uh, coronavirus this um, week that have finally hit. So we're a little bit behind um, the intensity of the Dallas timeline, but, but I've been really inspired by just seeing the uh, significant ways that the community have stepped up to do any little thing um, to, to help serve folks. Well, thanks, Ricky. And this, I mean, this is a, a recurring theme of communities really stepping up to the plate uh, to care for one another. Um, Chris, tell us about what's going on in uh, your neck of the woods. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I'm not going to repeat the wonderful ministries that Sylvia and Ricky have already mentioned, um, because 
that's redundant. Um, but I do want to offer a few a few things. Um, what we're calling our program to help shut in folks get groceries. And all we call it faith, hope, and love. And the, what we've set up is a, at the church phone number where any person who gets a hold of the church phone number can call and simply say faith, hope, and love, Christios, and then give their phone number. And then our volunteers actually call in twice a day to check that. And then the, the coordinator volunteer actually makes that connection and puts them together with a volunteer. So that's one efficiency that may be helpful. Um, the location of Wesley is right on uh, Highway 69, which is a major thoroughfare. So we put up um, just a real nice kind of sign and it just says, uh, um, you know, the, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness shall not overcome it. And uh, we put those up just as a reminder to the community um, that, you know, Christ is at work in the midst of all of this. Um, a couple of things that we're doing daily devotionals that go out through Facebook and through email. Um, uh, you can go through one, one idea. I did it for the first couple of days and was like, oh man, I can't keep this up. <laughs> Um, you can record a couple of days at a time if you do something like that. Don't be afraid. Um, the, the videos, um, I guess it was probably by the third day, I literally came in the office with four different shirts, and I'd mess my hair up in between videos, uh, so it looked different. But just, you know, don't kill yourself trying to do really good for folks. Um, find some efficiencies and don't be afraid of them. Um, one of the things that was unique for us here in Greenville, and Vienna knows, um, in Greenville we have Juice. It's a local, Greenville has its own utility network. And uh, I contacted the mayor and, you know, requested that they consider doing a deferral on shutoffs, uh, on um, utility turnoffs. And they did decide to go ahead and take that up. Now, for obvious reasons, they've not publicized that. But um, so that was a way that we were able to speak into the, the poverty cycle uh, there locally. Um, we have several medical doctors and professionals in the church. And so I, I've you know, recorded a blessing just for the medical community, kind of on that voice memo app, and then send that out to them. That's another thing we can do. Um, let's see. Da, 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 da. One interesting thing, so at Wesley we have, uh, it's called Just Older Youth, it's our joy group, but we, we call it kind of a not sit in a rocking chair retirees is a good way to describe that. Um, but they've gone through and started doing virtual scavenger hunts, um, which is kind of just a fun thing they do, uh, not for me, but they love it. So uh, uh, that's just an idea to keep people happy. Uh, along the, uh, the lines of getting Zoom community set up with Sunday School, um, one of the other things that we're doing is actually sending instructional YouTube links so that people who have never used Zoom can just watch a video on it. So that, that's a, a little next step there. Um, otherwise, everything else has been stated, so I don't want to... Uh, I don't want to rehash that kind of stuff. Oh, one, one, uh, one last little thought. So we have a Hunt Regional Medical Center here. One of our church members' sons is in medical sales. He contacted the dad, and the dad contacted me, and I contacted the hospital, um, but, you know, they couldn't get tests. And whenever there were half a million tests that came through this guy's supplier, well, we went through and short-circuited, and I texted the, the – um, um, administrator out here who's a church member said hey here's here's a person's phone number if you need tests call this person you know so there's some of those just off the cuff things that you and I may be able to to do by virtue of our uh, of our, our relationship in, in the community um, and I'll tell you one last little thing before I mute myself back I've had so many people who said um, like if we've messed up Sunday our live stream is absolutely like a train wreck man there were cars everywhere it was horrible horrible day right and i had so many people said don't sweat it thanks for doing everything you're doing keep going and i just want to encourage y'all i think our people are deeply 
moved by every effort you're making right now. And I'm making, we're all making. Um, they just need to know that Christ, the church, and you as our, their pastor, me as our pastor, their pastor, um, it means the world to them. And so I just want to encourage y'all, keep it up. Keep, just keep trying. Don't give up. Whatever you try, just do it the best you can and move on if you mess up. So anyway, thanks for this opportunity, Andrew, and God bless y'all. Well, one of the things that, um, you know, as I'm looking at the, the our pictures here and realize that uh, there are a number of us that are that are pastoring in rural settings, um, would love to give us time for some, some Q&A. Um, and also for those that are also in rural settings to be able to lift up what they're seeing. Um, so if you could uh, type into the chat box, if you've got a question, that way I can just kind of curate us to keep us from all speaking at once. Or if you have something that you want to lift up. Uh, before we get to um, for you, Sam, um, Samantha, uh, let's talk about um, the Carter Blood Drive. Uh, Dale, could you share about how that's getting set up, uh, especially, you know, to try to keep social distancing and, and all that? Uh, we are, uh, we had scheduled a, we'd scheduled a blood drive in conjunction with another event that we had to cancel, um, on May 9th. And I suspect we're going to, you know, continue to be in the situation at that time. But, um, what Carter asked is if they could bring, and they were going to bring the mobile unit anyway. So that, that kind of limits the number of staff and it limits the number of persons who can be donating at any one time for, to under the, the, the limit. Um, and so our plan is to open the church entrance that's closest to the, bat, to the, to the restroom facilities, which is that's, that's what they need restroom facilities because the, they're not available on the, on the mobile unit. And so we, we're, we're able to restrict access to the to those to those spaces, and then uh, we're going to rely on Carter. I mean, they're running the blood drive, so we're going to rely on Carter to enforce the social distancing and the congregating. I, my, I suspect what will happen is they'll ask people to stay in their cars until they're able to uh, access the blood mobile. And if they have walk-ups, they're going to need to figure out a way to sequester folks. But I don't, in our part of town, I'm not sure we're going to get a lot of walk-ups. Uh, I don't know if this works for everybody, but it was one of the things we were thinking about to try to use the building asset in a thoughtful way. Um, and uh, so that's, that's going to happen on May 9th. So we'll see how it goes. I suspect it's going to I mean, when we've done Carter blood, we've done blood drives before in the church, but they've always been on Sunday morning. And the, 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 the idea is to get congregants to, to do that while they're, while they're at church on Sunday. Uh, we're going to do this one on a Saturday. And I suspect we're going to do a little more reaching out in the neighbor, in the immediate neighborhood. So people can take advantage of the blood drive uh, in that way. So that's, that's our thought. It's, it's our thinking about how do we use the building asset kind of maintain, uh, maintain some 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 semblance of safety i mean there's a modest risk we're going to have people going inside to go use the bathroom and we'll control access i'm, I'm going to be there to do that and then we'll our staff will do the the deep clean after that's over with great and uh and dale you're at stonebridge umc in mckinney, McKinney. right yeah. okay so if you want to be be in touch with how to do this uh find yep. dale yep glad um, to have and uh, Samantha Parson, you've got a question about uh, the ministry with grants. Uh, so today is the last day uh, for the spring uh, grant cycle for ministry with grants. Um, so, but there's also an October 1st deadline, uh, which may help you for next uh, fall if you're looking for a greenhouse. Uh, please, if you could email me at Pfizer at ntcumc.org, F-I-S-E-R. Um, I've got some other connections to. Uh, uh, National Resource Conservation Service that uh, that may help you with what you're doing. Um, Estana, could you lift up the Hamilton Park work? 
So Hamilton Park is in a community right off of 75 in Forest Lane. And uh, there are many people that are in need of food and other kinds of things. So that congregation has um, done as much as they could to social distance themselves. Um, but they have, uh, from a distance, packed up food. And they're just having signs outside that if people are hungry, they can just drive up and the volunteers are having on uh, gloves and they're just handing it out to the persons on the passenger side for the most part. Um, and it, they don't have to be a, a member of the church. They don't have to live in the community. If they uh, are hungry, then they just come by and get food. So by word of mouth, this is going on and they have put it on Facebook and just wanted uh, to put that out there that that's going on in that church. It's not in the rural area, of course, but even in that Dallas area where there are lots of resources, we have a lot of people that are hungry. So thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Estana. Um, Andy, would you share about uh, input from a couple of our UM related nonprofits? You bet. So this week, I've connected with a handful of our uh, nonprofit partners. Um, there, there's a couple that I'll lift up right now. Well, let me actually say this one thing um, that, you know, we've probably heard that just like our local churches are having to, to pivot and work uh, double time in order to uh, keep, you know, our churches um, financially stable and that kind of thing. I mean, nonprofits are in the same boat. And so if you have uh, nonprofits that you partner with in your local communities, you might reach out to them and see how they're doing and um, and see how uh, you know, they're feeling about their outlook, their financial outlook. But I connected with a couple that I'll lift up. One is uh, Texas Impact. And uh, of course, they've been networking with and in dialogue with a number of uh, churches and judicatories all over the state. And a few things that came out of that call. One is that um, those folks who are involved in um, food distribution ministries, uh, you might be mindful of the, the possibility that in a month or two, when uh, folks who work hourly um, no longer are able to receive uh, unemployment benefits or perhaps extra benefits that are coming to them through the federal stimulus package begin to uh, run out, that um, the various food pantries um, in our communities could become overrun uh, in a couple months um, with folks who are not needing to go there yet, but in a couple months will need the benefit of those services. And so uh, having a conversation with um, the social service agencies in your communities could be valuable along that line. Um, another thing that Texas Impact lifted up is that um, the COVID situation is certainly impacting the border um, in some pretty significant ways. Uh, the border shut down. Um, uh, obviously, people who have uh, migrated to the United States and are in detention are um, at great risk. Uh, beyond prayer and uh, advocacy calls, uh, there's not a lot we can do about that. But um, there are a couple of groups in particular who are still uh, able to uh, shuttle food and resources across the border to the camps that are on the Mexico side of the border. And so, so if uh, immigration has been a concern for you and your church, um, you can still uh, uh, connect with Team Brownsville or Angry Tia's um, or other groups. And if you're interested in this, uh, connect with me and I can um, help you to support them. But just know that uh, the situation on the border is certainly being affected by this. Um, the other organization I talked with was Wesley Rankin. Um, they've pivoted and are doing some amazing things, just like so many of you are in your churches. Um, one thing I'd lift up from them is that uh, they are working with the North Texas Food Bank to provide a mobile food pantry. And from the, the point of view of the nonprofit or the church, um, they because they're able to guarantee about, I think, 200 uh, families who would come to that mobile food pantry in a given week, uh, North Texas Food Bank is willing to bring all of the, the foodstuffs they provide, package them together, and let Wesley Rankin be a pickup site. So 
depending on your church and the kind of reach you have, um, you could be a mobile food pantry site with the North Texas Food Bank as well. You could, um, or, or, or your, your uh, local food bank. So that might be something worth exploring. And the other thing I would lift up is the Wesley Rankin has a really vibrant ministry with senior adults. And of course, the senior adults, many of them are isolated as a rule. Uh, the ability to connect at Wesley Rankin is a huge gift to them. Uh, they're not able to do that in quite the same way. Um, but uh, they have organized volunteers to deliver food to seniors. Um, if you're in Dallas County and want to participate in that, they would welcome more volunteers. But something any of us can do um, is to uh, create, you know, just homemade uh, videos and messages um, that can be sent uh, through Wesley Rankin to those seniors and reach them in their homes. They're doing a lot of connection points with those seniors uh, using Facebook Live and other simple platforms. Um, but, uh, you know, Shelly Ross, their executive director, is receiving, you know, videos of kids playing the violin, and then they send that to their senior group. Um, and so again, you know, remotely, that's something that, that any of us, regardless of our location, um, can do. Again, for seniors through Wesley Rankin or seniors in your community. So I thought that was a, a helpful creative idea. I think that's it. I guess again, let me just uh, end by again saying that uh, the nonprofits uh, in your community are likely, uh, again, feeling the pinch just like uh, many of our local churches and so be mindful of uh, the partners that are in your community as well and how you can support them. Thanks. Thanks, Andy. And uh, Jessica, before we get to uh, your two posts, I uh, would like to get back to uh, Esta Anna. She wanted to add something to her piece. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I just wanted to add a caution. Uh, and as all of us are having different groups we're meeting with, that was with the group that involved some people from the medical field, we talked about the different ways people are giving out food. And she said, just be aware that all the precautions you're taking, you know, with the protective uh, gear and all of that, when you give out food, you can become vulnerable because someone gets sick. They will say, well, I got food from this location. So, you know, just want to lift that up to just take every precaution that you can um from handing the boxes out with gloved foods to the preparation to staying away so that you can document that you've done everything to protect uh the food that you're giving out so she lifted that up and i wanted to be sure and include that when we talk about the work from hamilton park and other groups like that thanks andrew thank you uh, and jessica could you uh talk about your two posts they really just were like points of information. Um, I had been the president of our Allen Ministerial Alliance for a couple of years. And as many of you um, may have uh, experienced in your own communities, those groups sometimes have a lot less participation than you'd hope uh, because some people just won't play in other people's sandboxes. That just happens. Um, but I reached out to um, a lot of those same contacts and uh, first I reached out to our helping agency, Allen Community Outreach, and said, faith leaders would really like to hear what you need because we have congregations full of people who are guessing, and, but they wanna be helpful in the most effective way, ways possible. Um, so I set that up with the director there first and then uh, called together faith leaders and said, we're gonna come listen to what our helping agency needs so that we can provide effective help. Because um, a lot of groups have sprung up on Facebook and other places trying to connect people um, who need with helpers. And that's fantastic. Um, but I think functioning through some of the existing organizations can be more effective um, and doesn't put people at risk. And there are a lot of just kind of risky behaviors I'm seeing people engage in out there. Um, and I forget what else I said. Was it about the toilet paper? Yeah, I mean, hand out toilet paper with everything, not physically handed out, it could be a basket. And it could be like, we have um, some of those, um, like Avery labels, you know, that you can send through the printer. So they don't have to be fancy, but it could just be like, we've got your back. 
whatever United Methodist Church, right? I mean, it could be really funny and it could have your worship times or your live stream or um, whatever might be helpful. Um, because I, it's just something that not everyone can find um, because I don't know why everyone um, bought all that up real quick. But yeah, the local helping agencies really appreciate being asked what they need. And I thought um, doing it in a way that is time effective for them as well, rather than getting 50 calls, because there are over 100 churches in Allen somehow, um, plus the mosque, plus the temples. Um, so having one moment where their director can share needs with us rather than um, getting kind of nickel and dimed for her time, so. Thank you, Jessica, That's, those are really great ideas. Uh, and Holly has shared on our chat box the Dallas Bethlehem Center of Food Distribution um, in South Dallas Fair Park that's going on on Thursdays. Holly, do you have any other information to add about Dallas Bethlehem Center? Um, no, they just contacted me yesterday and are in need of some volunteers. Some of their volunteers are older and now are um, staying home at all times and so needing some other volunteers. I know this is kind of, I'm finding that this is kind of a crazy ask for people right now, but I do think if there are volunteers who are well, who can shuffle some boxes and pack some food, they expect to serve maybe double what they have been serving um, on their Thursdays. Um, they are connected with the um, North Texas Food Bank and so already have those um, kind of good protocols in place. So would, anyone who wants to share it, would um, that would be really helpful. And if you are listening and, uh, and cannot see the chat box or access that, if you will email me at Pfizer at ntcumc.org, I can share that with you or call uh, and I'll put my number uh, in the chat box. Um, so Andy, you were able to listen in uh, on a call with some of our Latinx churches, uh, and, I, and Owen may be on the call as well. Uh, could you share a little bit about um, the situation involving some of our undocumented friends and those that may not be able to benefit from the CARES Act? Yeah, um, so in the meeting that we had last week with them, uh, there, was, there was real deep concern about the immigrant population for two reasons. One is they're Many of them are working in food services. They're hourly wage earners and not salaried. And so they are finding themselves without income, without food, and then also not being able to benefit from federal benefits, be they food stamps or, um, or, the, or the CARES Act. So they will not be getting that relief that those people who have uh, um, status here will be receiving. Uh, I know that the, the schools are assisting with offering some food and as well as I talked to Kenneth Wolverton yesterday and they're doing the Fast Packs Frisco and trying to reach out to them. So I do want to encourage churches to be mindful of the immigrant population that is around them because they're especially suffering uh, at this time. And, and the coronavirus is affecting them as well. I found out um, two nights ago that one of the family members of Christ Foundry uh, tested positive. And so I um, want you to encourage all of you to keep the immigrant population mindful in this season. Thank you, Owen. Uh, and Dale, uh, you are also lifting up uh, that there's a community lifeline center with a food pantry there in McKinney. Okay. Anything else to add for them? Oh, there's their website. If you need access to their website information, let, let me know as well. Okay. Uh, from y'all's perspective, and this is kind of open to, um, Jessica, could you share that about the counselors? Because I think that's before we get to the next thing, that's important. Oh, thanks. Um, sorry, my household also has a practicing musician, so enjoy. Um, so there, uh, for Title I schools, one of the things that's usually funded is uh, a staff position. They're called care counselors in Allen ISD, and they um, stay connected with those students who access their services beyond the elementary schools, because we don't have a Title I middle or high school, um, but poverty is present in every school. So they 
often have a good touch on families who may need um, service, who are reluctant to access the community resources that are usually out there because of fear around sharing their information. Um, Y'all probably are aware we had a huge ICE raid uh, in the last year. Um, so there are a lot of our community members, particularly in the uh, Latinx community, who just don't access those services. Um, so I, we've been in touch with those um, care counselors to make sure that um, we are aware of those needs because they know things. They are trusted people. And so um, we want to, that's how we've tried to be helpful to that community. All right. Well, thank you, Jessica. Um, so from where uh, each of you is sitting, um, realizing the things that are going on in your communities, the things that your church is doing, um, I'd like to know if there are ways that you can see us being able to collaborate to help you where you are or for you to be able to help others, um, because we want to be able to help facilitate and connect us in our various local contexts to, um, so that we can make an even bigger impact if possible for the kingdom. Uh, I don't have any uh, really long-term ideas, but I think, I think having short conference calls like what we have, maybe have another one, maybe in about two, three weeks, it's just checking how our souls are because it's, it's pretty lonely out in the rural districts and resources are hard to come by. And so so just, I guess, maybe maybe colleague to colleague kind of call and then also sharing more ideas and joys and concerns. Maybe something like that might be helpful. I know it will be helpful to me. Because right now I'm having just even a hard time of um, making sure our finances are met within the church. Okay, Andrew, um, I would, I haven't asked. I would have been trying to put together a group to help teachers, parents, kids in the schools, and we don't have access to the schools. We don't have access to kids. And so I noticed that WFAA has a weather thing that they put on Facebook Live uh, every day at one o'clock. So that gave me an idea. And so what I'm trying to do is put together a committee that would be willing to volunteer maybe an hour a week to either help with a math program, pro problem, listen to kids read or read. So we want to just, I want to get together a committee to see how we can be of service because parents didn't sign up to be teachers. They didn't sign up for homeschooling. And so now that they're there, uh, for those of us that, that love that kind of thing, if we can do something to help those parents, even if it's just doing a Facebook Live on a general topic and letting people know that's going on, uh, we're wanting to do that. So I have a couple of persons that uh, have already said, uh, sign me up, I wanna be a part of that. I will be pulling to that, get that group together. So if you're on this call and you know someone that would like to be a part of helping with educational kind of stuff, then um, email me at mastersntcumc.org and include your contact information and we will be getting back with you to um, see what we can do as a group to help. Uh, ultimately, it's gonna help the child. If you help the child, then it's gonna help the parents. If the kids are doing better, then when they come back to school, they won't have lost all that they have learned over this time. So it's a win-win, even if you can just do a little bit. So masters at ntcumc.org. I would love to hear from you and we'll put our thoughts together and come up with a plan to roll this out. Thanks. Thank you, S. Diana. And, um, and let's be sure to get in touch with S, uh, with uh, uh, Dorita Williams-Louis about uh, some connections that, that might be helpful with that as well. I did, um, uh, we okay. have talked. Okay, good. Thanks. Okay, uh, Chris. Um, one thing I know, even today, I, I'm not I'm not as skilled with a lot of the grief counseling that's about to be required or might already be needed. 
And if there were, certainly like when I was in Bogota and Henrietta, it would have been a huge help right now to have either a Zoom resource call where there was even a grief group. Um, you know, that, that kind of specialization didn't, certainly didn't exist for my office. And still today, I can't provide that at the level that's going to be needed. Um, and so, Andrew, if there was a way that the conference can set up either a resourcing for, for us in ministry or somewhere we can refer people and say, hey, our annual conference is having a Zoom grief group, um, uh, maybe even a, a refresher course for, for the rest of us just to say, hey, um, don't forget, here's how you can help a person manage through their grief process. Because, I mean, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to get some tough stuff happening uh, around us. So anyway, just a thought. Uh, Andy is mentioning that the uh, Center for Leadership Development is planning a couple of pastoral care focused calls for next week. So I'm imagining, okay, I'm imagining we'll get information about that Friday or, or so, Andy, is that right? Okay. Uh, Deanna, uh, I will try to uh, edit this chat uh, with our summary and at least get all of the, the information and links put onto a summary of this call and um, a recording of this call will be placed on our Center for Missional Outreach website. There'll be a special coronavirus response page and right below it will be a, a summary. Any other questions, ideas, ways that um, we can collectively be helpful? Okay. I want to thank you for your uh, leadership, both in terms of your congregational leadership and also your public leadership in your communities throughout this time. Uh, we want to uh, be thankful for you and your congregation's work uh, as y'all stepped up to the plate uh, to not only care for one another missionally, but, but, uh, but our neighbors throughout uh, the conference. Um, and we will uh, do some work on thinking about ways, uh, I know we're already doing that with the Center for Leadership Development, about sh being able to share our joys and concerns um, and have some face-to-face -face time uh, in the middle of so much isolation. I know that's hard on many of us, uh, all of us. Um, and talk about, um, as Diana, the, the needs of tutoring and see what we can do around that. And then uh, this grief counseling work and continue to get that information out. Um, Andy, would you be able to lead us in prayer as we close out today? You bet. Thanks, Andrew. Let's pray. Well, good and gracious God, as we move through this unfamiliar time. God, we trust and believe that you walk with us, that you are moving out ahead of us, that you are our rear guard, that you are the ground beneath our feet, and that however isolated even we may feel at times, we know that you are with us. God, as we continue to seek to care for and lead the people of our flocks, our congregations. May we also be ever mindful of the people in our wider community and the new kinds of needs that are emerging all around us. God, may we follow your lead and hear their cry and respond to their need with boldness and creativity. God, thank you for this opportunity to lean on one another and learn from one another. God, thank you for the opportunity to be witnesses to your great love and compassion in these days. And God, we do pray that as people observe the good works of the people in our churches, that they uh, will be pointed to our God in heaven. God, uh, walk with these, uh, your pastors and leaders, strengthen them, shepherd them, fill them with all that they need, and cover us in your grace. 
God, we are thankful for this time to be together. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. Good to see everybody. God bless you.